when the shoe dropped, what was your feeling? Was it like, did your heart just sink? It felt like they were trying to entrap trap me or to admit to it. That's what basically they want me to do is to admit to everything that they're saying was true. I felt so bad, I felt horrible, I felt so sad, I felt I just threw my life away. I feared that if everybody found out that I it would have been, I could have got murdered, you know, I could have got killed because guys have been killed in the military by other military guys. So it was, that was a big fear that, you know, every day I didn't want anyone to find out, you know, because I didn't want to be harassed. Well, when you join, you sign your, you got, you got to actually sign a piece of paper that you're not a homosexual. Really? Yes, they do. And I, I lied and I said, no. You said, no, but I'm willing to learn? No, but you can teach me. <laughs> the campaign started in the late 1950s, ran right up to 1992. It's important to remember that at the time, uh, we're only 10 years out of gay sex being a criminal offense. Gay men were still being arrested for gross indecency, which was really just a criminal offense designed to arrest gay men. I grew up in Ontario until I was 10. And so I was in foster care there, and I was still in touch with my real father. He found me um, one day. It was just by chance he saw me and found me. And so then they had to move me away from them. So then I moved to Paris, Ontario to a group home of boys. There was 13 of us, so it was really hard. So at 17, I got my own apartment and I signed up for the military. Oh, I was a steward. You're like a short order cook for the officers. You know, the, the captain, I was his steward. You make his bunk, you make sure his, his, his you know, he gets his uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and after dinner drinks or whatever. When the police came knocking at your door, the military police asking if you were gay, people were generally afraid. They could lose their job, they could go to jail, they'd be exposed. There was a lot at stake for these people. People committed suicide. It was a serious moment in Canadian history and it's been largely forgotten. I remember somebody came to uh, where I was working on the ship like, to, uh, to talk to me and they said, we have to talk to you in this office. And I'd never been in the office before. And, and then I saw it said interrogation on, on the, the, uh, the door. And then I thought, oh, okay, well, now I know what's going on. So then they sat me down and it was two guys that were drilling me and asking me all these questions. And I denied everything, you know, I lied again. <laughs> but because I wanted to, you know, keep my career. And, and I, I knew eventually, I knew it was going to come out eventually, so. I told my foster parents I was getting out, but I didn't tell them why. And um, I took my last paycheck. That's all they gave me, just like my last paycheck. And, and I, I got an airplane ticket, went to California with one suitcase. And, Never look back. What would an apology from the government like mean to you? Well, it just means that they're sorry about the way we were treated and that it was wrong and um, they were not all that bad after all, you know. Electronic coon hound or Belgian shepherd can detect a single drop of gay in a summer lake of straight. A trace of faggot residue, concealed but unirredactable, like an indiscretion in the eyes of God. A single particle of faggot can hang in the air for 17 hours. When it wafts downwind, the dog lifts its nose. 
shows its teeth. The fruit machine, better than your auntie's gaydar, built by serious men, calibrating resistance, vacuum tubes, apertures set, you're strapped in place, arms, wrists secure, head secure, immobilized. You are completely submissive. Technology's bitch, power bottom to the nation. The safe word is Diefenbaker. <laughs>